concept and how it's going to work this evening. Basically, the idea is, is to bring some of our kind of leading and most exciting research outside of the walls of, of academia and to a much wider audience into a format which we hope is actually kind of a really fun and interesting way to spend an evening. So things are going to walk. Bryce is going to talk for about 20 or 30 minutes this evening. Tops. <laughs> and um, during that time, we just ask um, if you can order any coffee, don't order any coffees or anything, because obviously the noise of the coffee machine can be a bit problematic for people trying to talk. After Bryce has finished speaking, we will have just a sort of a, a quick break for us to sort of refill our glasses. Anybody that needs to slide away, totally understand, please do. And then we'll kind of reconvene for a bit of discussion and kind of question and answer. Um, before we come to Bryce, I just want to say uh, an enormous thank you to our colleague Naomi, who's at the back there, who's fantastic at organising all these things, uh, Johnny and Sharon, a big thanks to AECC and Bournemouth University, and of course, Cafe Boston for opening the doors up this evening and welcoming all. Now, I'm sure I'm going to forget things, but just now, really, to move on to Bryce's talk. Um, Bryce is a senior lecturer in our design, engineering and computing department at Bournemouth University. And tonight, as the title says on the screen, he's going to talk to us about the fastest men on their legs, Oscar Soros, the classic limbs and the role of technology in sport. So welcome and thank you. Give me the back. Yeah. Those at the front, forgive me if I yell a little bit. All right. I'm going to do a short 20 to 30 minute talk on exactly what we've just been saying about aesthetic limbs and sport and what happened this year at the Olympics and then the Paralympics and try and fill in some of the things that you might not be so aware of what happened. Uh, what happens with these guys, how it, how it, some of the controversy behind it, get some of the stuff you wouldn't have known possibly so much about, some of the stuff you would. If anything springs to mind as I'm talking, just throw your hand up and just throw the question out. I really don't mind. Um, but the, the whole point of this is hopefully that you come away with a better understanding. There is no text really in these slides, there's no fancy animations, it's just pictures and chat and I'm giving it really, really straightforward and simple and the more fun side of it rather than me throwing up loads of formulas which take up lots of room. Alright. Oh, thank you. That's it. Okay. Paralympics itself started uh, around about 1960, officially started in 1960. It actually started before then. And the purpose of the actual Paralympic Games where they started was effectively uh, guys that had been injured in combat uh, needed to be rehabilitated. And most of those people were in wheelchairs. Uh, and medicine in the 50s isn't obviously what it is today. And it was felt that activity or sport in general was a great way to rehabilitate people. And it started, and this is a very early photo, of archery being one of the first sports that the people that were afflicted with disabilities could actually take part in. And back then, in the 50s and then the 60s, really the only disability that was catered for were those that were actually based in wheelchairs. But obviously over time, that had expanded. Obviously, this is a shot from this year and things have moved along somewhat. Amputees first started taking part in running-based activity at the Paralympics really by about 1976, and at that point, all disabilities at the Paralympics are put into classifications, and they're classified in terms of what they can and what they can't actually do physically. Functional classifications is what it's called. And the sport, actually running itself, is very well developed now. Now, this shot was taken in the, uh, one of the heats of this year's 2012 Paralympic Games, and you'll see eight individuals, all physically extremely fit, very, very lean, uh, very, very muscular. They train exactly as an elite athlete would do in able-bodied sport. So it's a very well-developed, well-funded, well-sponsored, someone like Pistorius especially, is a multi-million endorsed athlete, one of Nike's top athletes now. So it's a very well-developed sport. And it's, there's medals at stake. The athletes that you see in the Paralympic Games are on the same lottery funding system that their able-bodied equivalents would be. Someone like Pistorius, for example, or, or Johnny Peacock, for example, one of our British athletes who's a, a, an amputee athlete, will be on the same salary as someone like Chris Hoy would be. So they're judged and considered extremely 
Similarly, equally in terms of finance, sponsorship and handling, and management and support, physiotherapy and treatment. Now, technology in sport itself uh, helps us actually undertake that sport. That's what it should do. But the actual use of technology varies from sport to sport. So, for example, in Formula One, technology is actually part of the game. Engineering excellence, engineering ingenuity is part of the overall performance package. That one driver has a pyramid of some two or 300 staff below them that help provide that Formula One car. But in every sport, it isn't the same. In some sports, uh, technology is not very welcome. Uh, and the actual effect of it is actually try to be removed or reduced and minimised so that most of the effort is centred on the athlete, not actually on the person. Just as a, just sort of an audience participation thing very quickly, which one of these do you think is the odd one out? Then we've got a guess. Which one? The cyclist. Okay, anyone else think? Go on. Right, the answer actually is, it's actually story it's in the top right and the reason that he is the odd one out is all of these innovations were banned and are banned with the exception of the stories the top left is swimsuits these are known as fast suits or fast skins these were these came to use in the olympics from around about 2000 onwards and what happened catastrophically at the last olympic games was that so many world records were broken in from swimmers that you'd never heard of in heats and things that completely devalued the sport of swimming so what the governing body in swimming decided to do was what we'll do is then we'll then ban the suits. But unfortunately, by that point in time, the world records had already been established. So now the current crop of swimmers have now got to compete against world records without having the access to the same equipment their predecessors set the records by. Not, not, not a great situation. Bottom left is Graham Obray, who was a uh, Scotsman in the 90s. He pioneered two different, well, he actually pioneered two different unique forms of aerodynamic positioning on a bicycle, which allowed him to win world titles. And the hour record, he was banned once, came up with a different idea, and then did it again, and they banned him again. Um, he's also famous for his bicycle that he's riding there, it was actually made from components from a washing machine. On the more sort of, uh, yeah, comical stories. But bottom right side is actually the Polara Golf Ball. That was a ball that was created in the 1970s. It was designed with a, a dimple pattern that was very unique. It actually made your ball go straighter. Basically, if you're a crap golf player, it meant you wouldn't hook or slice as much. But the problem with that, of course, was the good players didn't get any worse, but the bad players suddenly got a lot better. So the value there wasn't really worth having, so they got rid of that. The storage was banned, but then reinstated. We'll come on to that later. All right, so for those that aren't from a medical background, I just want to give you a quick insight into amputees and the differences between it that might not be as obvious to you as when you see them on TV or at the competitions. Now, when you see, there are two basic amputee classifications when you watch the Paralympic Games, and they're referred to by number. Uh, one of them is the uh, T44, and one is the T42. T44 is any athlete that doesn't, or has, has lost their limb below the knee. The other one is an amputee that has lost their limb above the knee. There's also actually a classification that's called T43, which is an amputee that's lost, lost both limbs below the knee, which is technically what Oscar Pistorius is. But until recently, due to lack of numbers, they throw in the double and the single amputees in together, which, as I'll come on to later, is where the problems start. So we've got Johnny Peacock here on the far left-hand side. He was our British winner this year, won gold medal. Uh, was absolutely nowhere six months ago. Wasn't very good. Uh, knuckled down, got fitter, got stronger, got a hell of a lot leaner, and broke the world record in July at the US trials, went to London, and destroyed the field. Good for us. <laughs> One in the middle is Alan Oliveira, a Brazilian. Again, uh, caused plenty of controversy of his own, contact later as well. He, as you can see there, he is a double uh, bilateral amputee, so he's lost his limb below the kneecap on both sides. And the guy on the far right hand side is Richard Whitehead, the guy looks a bit like Arnold Schwarzenegger, okay? <laughs> uh, big lad, big lad. He's actually, bizarrely, compared to what he looks, he's actually more known for running marathons, but you're not allowed to run the marathon at the Paralympics at the moment as an amputee for bizarre reasons. So he ran the 200 metres instead using a very unique running style and then destroyed the world record in the process. But he's actually a double above the knee uh, amputee. Now that causes problems because the further down your amputation takes place, basically the most function you manage to keep. The higher up the amputation, the less you can do with that limb. 
Uh, just so as you know, when it comes to running and running quickly, most of the power that you generate comes from your ankles and your knees. And actually, the majority share of it actually comes from your ankles. Your ankles are roughly 250% efficient. So they actually produce two and a half times more than, they, than you'll put into them. By losing the ankle means that the amputee has to compensate for that somewhere else, and that's where the prosthetic blades actually help. When you lose the knee as well, you then lose the articulation, as some of you from physiotherapy or the current college will obviously be aware about, which makes it even harder. In fact, when you watch Richard Whitehead run, and watch this on YouTube, he runs almost like an egg whisk. He actually whisks his eggs around. It's incredibly effective, but it isn't what you would call running. Very, very different. Bloody efficient, though. Right. Okay, so Pistorius, who is he? You've all heard about him, I'm sure, in the news. This is Oscar Pistorius, age six. Born in 1986. So a happy family, brothers and sisters like all of us, had normal hobbies, normal interests, from a, what we would probably assume would be a middle class family in South Africa. Nothing particularly abnormal about it. Only problem was, was that Oscar was born with bones missing in both his lower legs. The feet were, were there, but the actual one of his bones, I think it was his fibula bone, was actually missing on both legs, which put his parents in a bit of a difficult situation. They kind of leave him as he was, He'd have feet, and he would look reasonably, and I'll use inverted commas, normal. Okay? Uh, or they could amputate his legs, which would not make him look terribly normal, but give him a greater quality of freedom. And it's probably a pretty difficult decision for a parent to have to make. I don't know, I haven't had to do it. But the point is, it was a pretty big call. In the end, they decided to amputate. And this photo, I think he was age six in this one. Um, what he's actually got on there, he's got what we call stubbies, which are what are training prosthesis. They're effectively a shell which goes over the top of the stump, with a very, very thick base, and it puts most of the load of his body weight onto the top of the sort of edge of the prosthesis, and doesn't have anything touching the bottom. What would be most painful, obviously, when you've got bone and then soft tissue underneath it. But as you can see, he was a pretty happy kid. He did water skiing, he played rugby with prosthesis, he went, he's done hiking, running, he's done every, he was from a sporty family, sporty background. The fact he had double amputations didn't stop him. Great for rugby, because that one's probably too afraid to tackle him. That's the beauty of it. But he's a nice guy. I've actually met him and had dinner with him. He's a fantastic guy. Right, so here we are. Photo of Oscar, taken in 2004. Obviously a little bit older by now. His uh, sports career sort of manifested itself in 2004. Again, he was in his early 20s. He uh, had come from a rugby background and decided to do amputee sprinting because his coach would be good for his training. He tried it and suddenly realised he was actually quite good at it. Um, and he probably wouldn't take offence at this, but in 2004 he was a little bit fat, which as an athlete isn't ideal. But when he realised he was good, he got fitter, he got the right coaches, he got the right physiotherapy and support and treatment. And in the end he was sponsored by a company called Ossa, who were probably the biggest manufacturer of uh, lower limb prosthesis on the planet, and they sponsor most of the, the big athletes in this sport. All right, so we get into the unfair. What is fairness? What does that really mean in sport in everyday life? What does it really mean? So, why sports technology can be problematic in most sports that you'll see is for sometimes for very different reasons. If you go to the top right, that's uh, Kathy Freeman, 2000 Olympic Games in Australia. You can see what she's wearing there. Uh, I suppose we probably call it a gimp suit now, I suppose, for lack of a better expression. But that, it was actually a serious piece of equipment back then. What it was, it was an all-in-one leotard with a, with a head covering. And the point of that was basically to make her as aerodynamically as efficient as possible. And it might seem quite ridiculous, but when you actually work out the margins between getting a medal and not at the Olympic Games, basically you should try everything you get. Now, I actually did a few rough formulas, calculations, a couple of years back about the same bowl and how much more he'd break the world record by if he tucked in that damn vest, wore less flappy clothing, okay, and took it seriously, I think he'd go below nine and a half seconds, that's beside the point. These are the sort of things that as an academic you get riled about, I'm probably not normal. Anyway, right, top left is boxing headgear. Oh, sorry, the point of the Kathy Freeman one was that the problem with that piece of technology was it was manufactured by Nike. Now, every athlete has different sponsorships and endorsement deals. So they couldn't all access that technology, which meant that she had an unfair advantage. Equal access to technology. You should all be able, be able to use whatever technology you want to give you the best possible chance of winning. You can decline it if you want, but you should have equal access. In that case, you can actually still use that suit, it just never really took off. But the point is, is that a sport, all its participants should have an equal access. Top left is amateur boxing. 
where they use headgear. Uh, that's about safety. So safety with sports technology is important. You shouldn't implement a technology that's going to make the sport more dangerous. Actually, the irony of that actually is, not many people know this, but actually, despite amateur boxing uses headgear, it actually has a higher rate of head injuries than pro boxing does. The reason being is, we think, is because athletes feel, because the other person's got headgear on, they can hit them full tilt. Because there's always that little thing about holding back a little bit, sometimes when you punch someone. If they've got an added impression of safety, psychologically, the, the, the only person thinks, oh, it's always got safety gear, I can go full tilt. So actually, the incidence of headgear is worse for implementing safety headgear. It's what we call a revenge effect. You get a, a secondary effect of introducing a science or a technology. Not ideal. Bottom left, quite a load of guys in Lycra at the roadside. I'm a cyclist, so I can take the mickey out of this. The point is, is that that's about participation. You don't implement a technology that actually decreases participation, because there's no point winning a medal if, if you're not up against anyone. If you think back, if any of you are interested in sport, the best eras of the sport that you probably love is when you have rivals. You have two or three guys or girls battling it out with each other, trying to win medals. That's when you elevate the sport. Boxing had its golden era, now less so. Formula One, two or three drivers, Prost and Senna, taking each other off a track, that kind of stuff. The last one, I'll put this one in, this is uh, fencing obviously, but the actual person there is Boris Oleshenko. I think this was the 76 or the 72 games. What he basically did was he actually rigged his equipment, his, uh, his uh, sword epee, to register a false hit on his opponent. I mean, that's not technology, that's just outright cheating. Okay? <laughs> but it was quite cool for ingenuity, I thought. Basically, he had a little switch that he concealed inside his fencing foil, and every time he contacted it, whether he hit or not, he pushed the button and scored a hit. And no one caught wind of this, and in the end, they, they found out in the end, disqualified him and the rest of his Russian fencing team. But I thought it was bloody clever thinking, real natural thinking. But, uh, there you go. but that's outright cheating, so that's what people get an advantage over the sport itself. Again, not good with technology. Now, where this is important in anti sprinting is that because you can be dealing with athletes from different countries, different societies, different sociologies, bringing, upbringings, that kind of thing, ultimately you can have people using different prostheses. Now, it's all very well for Pistorius, who's fully endorsed, fully sponsored. He can access the latest, greatest prosthesis known to man. Some guy from Ghana probably can't. So we've got to be a little bit careful. In fact, most of my research is centered around this problem. You've got to be a little bit careful because if suddenly you end up with as being part of the influencing factor of results, then that's not necessarily right. Or, more importantly, you either accept that it's there and let everyone go nuts with the science like you would do with Formula One, or you draw a line and say, hang on a sec, this isn't right. You know, this guy's winning medals because he's got better equipment, and you stop it right there. This is the worst case scenario, not Superman, but basically cyborgs effectively. And we're at this stage now, there are already procedures out there that I can hardwire into your brain, basically, that can get your limb working again. It's a bit clunky, it's a bit like a mobile phone from the 90s, isn't it? a big brick on the side of your head with an extendable aerial. We give it 10 years, whereas battery technology will get smaller, lighter, more efficient, um, hydraulics will get lighter, we'll use better materials. What ultimately will happen is that the moral dilemma that's going to arise then is if someone's had an amputation they've lost through no fault of their own, then surely they should allow to have the opportunity to have that limb restored. But then what if they want to participate in sport? What do you then do? Do you make them all use bouncy springs as a prosthesis? Or do you let them use this kind of hardware? Because the reality is that within five to six years this is going to be a real issue. Someone like Pistorius, it won't be Pistorius, it'll be someone that's probably about 14, 15 years of age at the moment. In about couple of Olympic Games time, he's going to try and run at the Olympic Games with a, a limb like this, you know, the right or pickle, because you don't really know whether you should say no or whether you should say yes, and how should you judge that person. So this is the worst case and ultimately likely scenario. So let me give you a short history of prosthesis and prosthetics. And um, no one's eating at the moment, are they? Good, right, there is nothing <laughs> gory here, but I just want to make sure. Right, okay. Prosthesis, top left, prosthesis as a piece of technology or a piece of assistive technology, we like to call it, has been around for thousands of years. Up on the top left is actually an Egyptian prosthesis that was found and dug up. So you're getting on for 3,000 years old and then some. Uh, it's made of leather and wood. It's basically designed, some had obviously left their and lost their toes through some misfortunate act. Um, actually, while I'm on that point for a minute, there's two different types of amputation for those that aren't aware. You either have congenital, whereby you're born with a lack of an, uh, a limb absence, or you have a traumatic scenario such as uh, mine, IED, in based injury, uh, armed forces in Iraq or you know, Yugoslavia, that kind of stuff. 
for people who lose a, a, a limb through a traumatic event. Anyway, this is where someone had actually lost their toes, just their toes, so the Egyptians had fabricated using leather and wood a substitute. I don't know how good it would be, obviously, but it's lasted pretty well. Right, top right is uh, Queen Vishpla, who was uh, an Indian queen, a warrior queen, as, as stories say. Basically, she lost, well, she lost a leg, she had it cut off in battle. And the theme of battle is something we'll come back to a little bit later on. But anyway, she lost her limb in combat, in battle, so they made her a new one uh, out of iron, which I'm sure the horse wasn't very uh, sort of happy about, but it would have been pretty bloody heavy. But basically, it you know restored her limb absence, and that's getting back another couple of thousand years now. Bottom photo, so you probably want to see it very well from the back. This is basically barber surgery, so this is real field combat stuff now. We're getting back into the 16 and 1700s. Now, medicine, we're getting, you know, sort of pre-penicillin and, you know, national health. Medicine was pretty basic back then. If you got injured, shrapnel, infection, which was the biggest killer back then, the only way you could treat it was effectively to remove the limb. You know, there wasn't antibiotics, there wasn't anything like that. And the way they did it was pretty bloody gruesome. Basically, you were hauled into a tent in the middle of the, in the theatre of war, effectively. Uh, five of your fellow friends would hold you down on a table whilst the barber surgeon with the equivalent of a hacksaw would then remove your limb without <coughs> anaesthetic. If you survive the blood loss, you would then probably have it cauterised uh, with a burning flame, later uh, hot boiling oil, and if you survived all of that, you were good. <laughs> okay. If you didn't, you died, and the majority died. Uh, infection, as I say, was the biggest killer back then. And in that photo, what you basically got is a big crowd of guys sat around looking at someone strapped to a table, with the barber surgeon sharpening up his hacksaw, ready to go for the leg. Uh, it was pretty gruesome stuff, but that was what it was back then. So, luckily, uh, we kind of moved on. Anyway, prosthesis, the one on the left hand side is sort of like a clap of leg. It's really. It, a loss of limb back then was more about aesthetics, about looking human. Uh, and restoring the aesthetic of what a human being actually is. And on the left, there's got a very dressy shoe, and leather, metal, uh, anything that would have been commonly available in, in that time, which again was probably leather and iron. One on the right is, I think, what we call a Terry Fox leg. It was named after a guy, strangely called Terry Fox, who is famous for basically losing his limb and then deciding to run across Canada. If you can sort of imagine back the Forrest Gump, when Forrest Gump runs across the States and he felt like it, that was loosely based on Terry Fox. Woke up one morning and thought, my life is basically shit. I'm going to run across Canada, uh, raise loads of money for cancer, and do something worthwhile. Worth look, looking up about, she's an interesting guy. Sadly died. Not during the run, but he, uh, he got to the other side of the country. There's a big statue of him there in Canada, a real famous guy, brilliant. Anyway, his prosthesis used a metal coil spring, effectively, and that was joined to the socket, which goes on the top of the stump, and obviously as you would then impact the ground, the spring would compress and then recoil. Same as a suspension on a motorcycle or a mountain bike, that sort of thing. Still pretty basic, very, very heavy, but it would allow the guy to run, and that was kind of where it all started. And this brings us to where we are now with what, I, what we refer to in the trade as an energy return prosthesis. They have lots of different names. Cheetah legs is probably the biggest media-friendly and we had Cheetah because the guy that designed it uh, suggested that the actual shape of it referred to the back legs of the Cheetah, not Cheetah as in it cheats. Okay? <laughs> so it's sort of, sort of quite different to that. And uh, it was invented roughly about 1984. First saw use in the Paralympic Games around right 1988. Uh, there was a sudden dramatic change in results from that period of time onwards. Uh, runners suddenly improve their time by about a second overnight. It just so you off the top of your head. At the moment, the, the world record for uh, the 100 metres by Johnny Peacock is roughly about a second slower than Usain Bolt, give or take. He did it. In fact, his time that he actually did that at the US trials this year. Uh, the women are about a second and a half behind their open bodied equivalent. That's mainly because the reason is that the women's sport hasn't developed quite enough yet to see times drive down. But they will, they'll follow. Um, and it was this technology which ultimately allowed them to do it. And you might think it's a state of the art, but it has been around for nearly 25 years as a basic technology. What you've actually got here is a uh, socket which sits over the top of the stump. And that socket and its liner, the liner is made of silicon. And that basic, that limb is suspended in this area of the limb so that the bottom of the stump doesn't, can't touch anything else. It would be very, very painful, very, very uncomfortable. 
You then got the basic socket sheath here, the main outer structure, which is made of carbon fiber composite, and because it's light, it's strong, but its power to weight is you know, incredibly you know, a lot better than steel's equivalent would be. You've got titanium bolts and fixings, and then the carbon fiber composite spring, which runs all the way around there, which that is all it is, it is just a spring. And then Pistorius on this is Pistorius' leg. What he's got here is is actually on his old leg, his old leg, he's actually got the bottom of a trainer that he's cut off, stuck to the bottom of this with running spikes. Uh, so that allows him grip. Because the problem that these amputees have when they're running the bend or something like the 200 metres or the 400 metres, as they start to go into the bend, they start losing traction. With you, because you've got an ankle, you can obviously pivot your ankle to maintain traction control effectively. An amputee can't do that in the same way because they haven't got the same articulation. And there was a situation uh, oh, a couple of years ago, uh, the story is ran outside his lane at Crystal Palace. It was so wet, he just couldn't get around the bend, just run straight off and got disqualified. But the point is, so he does have to maintain traction, and his latest prosthesis uh, that he uses for more distance based running when he's training is actually being manufactured by Nike. And it's actually like a slip on sole that slips over the top of this, like a trainer. It's a real neat piece of design, it looks very flash, but the sprinters don't use it, only distance runners really. Stunning bolts, very, very light. Probably cost you in the region of about five grand for a basic one. Uh, Pistorius' first generation models, going back nearly 10 years now, would have been the equivalent of 10, 15 grand at the time. It's a lot cheaper now, like all technology. So, the big question are they actually performance enhancing? Well, we give the basic mechanics of what makes a runner fast over 100 metres. There are three basic components you need to have. If you're going to run 100 metres really, really quickly. First one is your stride length. So how much distance do you cover from left to right limb when you're running at full speed? The longer that stride, the more ground you cover, therefore the faster you'll get to the finish line. That's one of them. The second one is how much force you can put into the ground. The more force you put into the ground, the more vertical your body goes, the more you fly through the air, you then cover more ground, there go, you go faster. And the last one, is basically how quickly can you move your legs per second and it's generally roughly speaking uh, a sprinter will use that will have an impact about four and a half times their body weight okay uh, roughly about well I'm trying to think how many times a second they do at the moment it's been quite fast I'll come back to that but the point is is that in about 100 meter race they'll do about 52 strides if they're an average sprinter a good sprinter like the Storis or Peacock will do 49 strides, 49 steps, sorry, in a 100 metre race. The most important one of these features, until the last 10 years, researchers believe that each one of these were equally important. But modern research now teaches us that actually the big one is how much force you put in. Because if you put more force in, that will actually affect the stride length anyway, and ultimately how fast you can move your leg. So the best sprinters, the Usain Bolt to this world, the difference between them and the next guy is one, that they can have a good reaction time out the blocks. And secondly, they just push more force into the ground. That's all it is. And that's obviously created by muscle, power, and that kind of thing. Now, of course, the problem with Pistorius has got, like I said to you guys earlier, Pistorius has no ankles, which means he can't generate as much power as an able bodied equivalent. So, in theory, you'd think he'd be at a disadvantage, and that was generally how things were felt. However, in 2008, to give you a bit of background to his story, people were starting to get a little bit concerned that the technology was having too much impact and that Pistorius should be banned. Now remember back in 2008, Pistorius was the only double amputee of his kind that was trying to seek access to the Olympic Games. That's going to change in the very near future. So what happened was, was that the IAAF, which was the governing body for athletics, looked at Pistorius and decided to ban him. Historius then challenged them on it, and they all decided what they'd do is they'd get a group of researchers to analyse Pistorius and then rule on whether he had an advantage or not. And the study was conducted in Germany at the University of Cologne, and the researchers, after a bit of time, decided that he had an advantage because he used less oxygen when running than the equivalent runners. So they banned him. Now, Pistorius was obviously somewhat aggrieved by this, so what he did was he flew out to the States and got a counter study done by some American researchers. And lo and behold, they came back and said, no, he doesn't have an advantage at all, we were wrong. 
So the IWF at that point were completely confused. We've got one load of researchers, like the experts in the field, saying one thing in Germany, another load in the US saying something else. So in the end, they gave up and kind of thought, all right, why don't you use the same legs that you don't change them, you can keep running, and if you can make the qualification time, you can go to the games. Only problem was, by the time they decided on that, Pistorius was only a, a few weeks out from the games and was so unfit at that point, he couldn't hit the qualification time, so he couldn't go. Um, as it was, his own uh, South a Athletics of South Africa could have actually selected him for the team relay in the 400 metre relay, and they chose not to. And no reason was ever given why they didn't select it. Probably because they were worried about the repercussions of negative publicity by doing so. I think they actually would have done the opposite if they tried it. So Pistorius was a bit ticked off to say the least. However, he vowed he, in four years' time after that at the London Games that he would take his chance, he would try and meet the qualification time, which he has to do twice, by the way, and that he would go to London, which, as we all now know, he actually managed to achieve, and he went. So, what is the problem with ruling? I've got the Lawrence and the board, you may ask that to do with The problem with how you judge an FPT sprinter is effectively how you compare it and what you compare it against. The old expression is comparing apples to oranges. But the point here is, is that when Pistorius was originally outlawed by the Germans, so I'm going to refer to them as the Germans because it's just the easiest way I come up with. <laughs> <laughs> I know the entire country, it's not us versus the Germans, it's not 1966 all over again. Okay. But the point is, the Germans um, decided that he used, uh, he was more efficient at uh, using oxygen uh, for less effort. However, it depends what you compare them against. What the Germans have decided to do was they compared Pistorius to a load of runners that were judged to be of equivalent standard. And they chose runners that could do the 400 metres in roughly the same time that Pistorius could do. Now that sounds right, because it's comparing like for like. What that doesn't take into account is, is that Pistorius is an elite athlete. The runners he was up against may be the equivalent in terms of time, but they wouldn't come anywhere at the Olympic Games in terms of being elite. They're not elite 400 metre runners. So what you've got to be careful about is what you compare your athlete to. Do you compare the stories to able body, or do you basically understand what is elite, and I use the term loosely because I don't know, what does elite athlete, what does it mean as a, as a definition? And then it may be that if you actually compare the story to the equivalent elite 400 metre runner, he's actually running slower and using oxygen in a different way. So however we conduct research, however those of us that are academics here or those who are interested in research, be very careful what your methods are and what you're comparing against. There are always limitations to your actual research. <coughs> Did anyone have any like just seeing how much oxygen you use? Because I mean, the whole idea of the screen is like yep. an aerobic sport. So you hardly use any oxygen. Brilliant. And we're going to come with that. What I'm going to do next. No, it's actually a really good point. Where I'm going, where he's going with this, and it's exactly what I wanted to tie into, is how you judge someone. Pistorius runs the 400 metres, which is. Uh, roughly speaking, something like, I think it's 60 to 70% aerobic as an activity. So it uses more of your aerobic system. The 100 metres doesn't use hardly any aerobic qualities whatsoever. It's basically, about, as I've already told you, it's about power, muscular power. So the Germans out of Pistorius because he used oxygen more efficiently, even though he doesn't use very much oxygen in the 100 metres. They use the wrong criteria. The other difference is the Americans who got him off the uh, sentence were equally bad because who they used for their research to get him off was a single-sided amputee, not a double amputee. That again is like comparing apples to oranges. A double amputee and a single amputee are completely different animals, basically. They run differently, they start differently, and it, in simplistic terms, if you watch the 100 metres event at the Paralympics, you'll mainly see single-sided amputees winning the medals. The longer the event goes on, the more the double amputees will be, will be more advantage, I should say. There's reasons why that is. I'm not going to go into it now because the formula is very, very long and I haven't published it yet. Okay, but the, <laughs> the bottom line basically is, is there's a very unique effect which I call the trampoline effect. If you can imagine yourselves jumping up and down on a trampoline, if you imagine bouncing and jumping up, after a while you'll find it suddenly, once you initially, I'm going to start bouncing now, it's going to look weird, but just go with me. All right? you're, just, you're kind of jumping, you initially get going. After a while, it starts getting easier to maintain the height because you're getting momentum and you're allowing the body to compress, absorb the energy, and then release it. And that's basically what happens to a bilateral amputee when they're running the length of the track. Once they get up to speed and their speed is constant, they enter this trampoline effect. Now, a unilateral, a single sided amputee can't do that because their biological leg isn't springy in that kind of way. So basically, one leg counters the other. 
But because the 100 metres is about muscle and power, the single sided amputees have a better start because they can start from their biological leg, which doesn't compress under load. They can, the leg will automatically stiffen as you apply load to it. So what I'm basically saying here in a long-winded way is that single side amputees are better at 100 metres, but Storius is ultimately better at 400 metres. When the time comes when we get a marathon runner who is a double amputee, is physically as fit as the Ethiopians and the Kenyans are now, they're going to do about 155 for a marathon, and they'll, just, they'll change the face of athletics overnight, and it's going to happen. The other point where I'm kind of leading on from his question is really that, like I've already said, Pistorius can't run a bend. The Germans nor the Americans checked that. They didn't see it as important. They only checked the runner at a steady state speed. But you guys will know from watching athletics yourself is that steady state doesn't exist in sprint events. You accelerate, then you hold steady state, and then you basically die very spectacularly and quickly. Okay? So it's not held at a steady state. The 400 metres does have a greater element of steady state running, but it's still not as much, and with a marathon, obviously, it would be predominantly steady state. So the bottom line here is they're not using the right criteria to assess these guys. I'm not saying they've got an advantage, we're saying they haven't, they haven't worked it out yet. The last thing is the story is can't start for toffee. Okay? He can't. Because what happens is, because he's effectively on top of a trampoline, as he starts and the gun goes and everyone rushes out, everyone else goes forward, he goes backwards because all his legs do is just compress. He's then got to wait for the energy to get into the legs, then spring forward again. So there's a slight lull, which is why obviously the stories have a shocking start. In the last 30 metres, something comes through like an absolute rocket because he's suddenly got up to speed. So neither of these elements has actually been checked in research yet or assessed, mainly because they don't have a lot of these sprinters around. Two, until about two years ago, no one cared. Okay? And three, ultimately because of the fact of what difference will have on the wider society. All right, so ultimately, what we're doing here is you're comparing two different kinds of locomotion. And that's the problem. You can't, you've got to compare like for like, or try and simulate or assess running as best you can, and then assess on that basis. At this point, I've kind of focused more on the actual practical science of it. There is as much an ethical question about this, and I've had long, drunken debates with girlfriends, families, and friends to the small hours about whether these guys should be allowed to run or not, because it's as much an ethical thing about what you actually believe in terms of human rights, in terms of society, in terms of how you think sports should be conducted to whether these guys should be allowed to run. So, that takes up the London 2012. What happened? Did you go for a drink? Right. This is the shot of the reel. Finally, the South Africans, who Pistorius had fallen out with several times because they refused to select him, put him in the relay team. They put him in the relay team because Pistorius is the second fastest guy in South Africa. So they were kind of forced into it, really. Um, he's the second fastest guy over 400 metres. Again, yeah, about over 100 either, really, but 400 metres is his forte. Um, so they selected him. Earlier in the year, he'd run uh, another, I think, I can't remember which athletics meet it was, but they, the governing body made him run on the last leg of the relay. Uh, no, they actually made him run, sorry, I'll tell you that, made him run on the first leg of the relay because they were worried about the safety of him endangering other competitors, which was absolutely ridiculous. He's no more lethal than anyone else would be. Um, so, it was a bit silly, really. The downside to that, of course, is because Pistorius runs better when he's already up to speed, actually massively penalised the South African team. That said, they still cut off the silver medal at the World Champs and made everyone look very, very silly. And that again raised a lot of ethical questions about, oh shit, it's really happened, and Amputee has now won a medal. Now that's quite important because if you're the athlete that's in fourth place and you get paid your national lottery funding or equivalent based on your results, and Amputee Sprinting has just beaten you, what does that then mean to the sport? You're suddenly going to think, does he have an advantage? Does he not? You're going to think about it. So the governing body is sort of cooked in a rock and a hard place. If you don't let him run, you're effectively impeding his, his ability to earn a living, which is questionable, because there's no empirical research that says he's got a, 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 an advantage. But if you do allow him to run, then suddenly you're going to end up with a problem sooner or later where these guys could effectively, you know, be able-bodied. And don't be fooled for a minute that these guys won't have... Able-bodied people won't have surgery to have their limbs removed to be an active runner if they'll run faster. It has already happened in other sports. I'll give you a good example. In baseball, US baseball, uh, oh, crikey, I can't remember how long ago this was now, but there was a guy called Tommy John. He was a baseball uh, batter predominantly, and a really strong pitch. Uh, injured his right arm, went off to surgery, and they said, well, what we're going to do here is we're going to take the tendon from your right leg, stick it in your arm, and it'll help you repair the tendon. Great. 
got rehabilitated, went back to pro baseball and suddenly realised that his batting distance has increased. Why? Because the tendons in the leg are better than the tendons in the arm. They're stronger, thicker. So, of course, what happened then? Every other baseball batter thinks, shit, I'll have that surgery. You know, because obviously it's worth money to. So, don't be fooled for a second that people won't do radical things if it's in their financial interest or egotistical interest to do so. So it's entirely plausible that an able-bodied person would have their legs amputated if they felt they could run better and earn good money from doing so. Anyway, in the relay, it didn't go well for the South Africans at the Olympics. They weren't running very, very well. There's a big difference between the Worlds and the Olympic Games. The Olympic Games, as far as athletics is concerned, is the pinnacle of achievement. Everyone brought their best team. Everyone was in shape. And they didn't, I think they came fifth, or they didn't come anywhere, but they, they did okay, but they didn't do as well as they'd done at the world. Pistorius was ultimately disappointed because he was, he was going to go after four medals one from the Olympics, this one, and then three more in the Paralympics. It, as you know, it was the 400 metres as well, but that didn't go so well. Right, so we move on to the Paralympics. The 200 metres game, this was the big one. For about three days, I was pulled from pillar to post, being asked my opinion on a guy that I'd never even heard of until about a week before. The guy in question is a guy called Alan Oliveira. And again, if you actually look at him there, his amputation is exactly the same story. His actual stump length is slightly less. And one thing we do know about amputees is, is that one of the more advantageous sides of them is because they've got less limb left, it's a lighter lower limb, therefore it's quicker to move it through the air. So one of the other find, key findings of the German study was that because they've got less mass to move of their leg, it's easy for them to run fast, which is obviously true. They just get people in different ways. And the point really is that they're involved. What my research shows is their advantage in some ways, and disadvantage in others. Like that thing about locomotion, they're basically just different animals. Anyway, around the 200 metres, uh, Pistorius was cruising his way around, looked really good at 100 metres to go, then Oliveira came out of nowhere and beat him. And the bottom right hand photo, which was taken uh, shortly after he finished, showed Pistorius looking somewhat less than happy, probably because of the fact that he, he thought he was just cruising, he never thought there was going to be anyone there. Uh, Oliveira had been nowhere three months before, absolutely no, it wasn't particularly good. He was he made the final, but he never really tested Pistorius. And suddenly this guy's come out of nowhere, beaten Pistorius, and Pistorius has just lost gold in one of his favourite events. He was not a happy boy. Now, for those that saw the media interview directly after, the right, never interview an athlete right after an event, <laughs> it's a bad idea. If anyone's ever asked me questions after an event, girlfriends, loved ones, they've always had a mouthful unless it goes really, really well. So the point was, was that Pistorius, his emotions are running high, and he basically said, Oliveira has got an unfair advantage because he's using longer prosthetic limbs than I am. Uh, therefore, he takes less strides, ultimately, therefore he's got an advantage, which is kind of a, calling the pot kettle black, really. Bear in mind, it was four years ago, everyone was saying it was Pistorius had the advantage. He said, oh, no, 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 I've got no advantage. And now here he is saying, he's got an advantage, it's unfair. You know, it's kind of a bit like that. Um, as it was, if you actually count the number of steps that took place at that event, actually, Pistorius took less steps than Oliveira did. So actually, Pistorius was better off than Oliveira was. The difference was that Pistorius was lazy, he was trying to save energy, he had a big program, lots of races to do, and Oliveira had changed his prosthesis prescription, and he had used a longer prosthesis, but they were within the rules. And the way those rules are constructed is that the length of the prosthesis is based on an estimation of what your genetic height would be if you had real legs. And they do that as a ratio of your arm span and your torso length, effectively. And that allows them to calculate what the leg length should be. Up to that point, yeah, Oliveira did have shorter limbs, but they probably weren't very good ones. And what happened is, is that he got hold of better limbs, took it right up to the line of the rules, because that's what you all do as an athlete. You take it to the, the limit of the rules, but no further. And he ran with those, and basically he won. And uh, Pistorius wasn't very happy. So, things not going so well for Pistorius so far. We moving to the 100. Now, Pistorius knew he was up against it here, because Peacock, who was our great British unilateral athlete here, had already shattered the world record back in the July. Looked in good shape, was pretty fearless, and because he was young, it was his first game, he had nothing to lose, really. All the pressure was on Pistorius, because he'd come in as a defending champion, won every amputee sprinting event the previous games, and so really, Peacock had nothing to lose. The, oh, that's Forey, the other South African unilateral amputee, and I think that was Jerome Singleton there on the right, it might not be, I'll double check that, but basically, these guys were unilateral, 
Pistorius finished in fourth, which, as any athlete will tell you, is the worst place to finish an event. You'd rather come last than finish in fourth. Uh, but th at that point, Pistorius was pretty dejected. He was getting pulled around by the media all over the place because of his outburst a day or two before. And as a result, now he hadn't got a medal in that event either, which only left him one event left, which was his staple event, the 400 metres. Which, <laughs> luckily, ended in success. This time, Pistorius had no chances, uh, didn't hold anything back in the heats or the finish. And what you can basically see in the very distance is uh, Oliveira is there, who had been actually having some problems at the time. I'll come to that in a minute. And the other athletes weren't even within 15 metres. He annihilated them. He was so angry at that point. Not only did he want to win, he wanted to absolutely punish them. And he embarrassed them. And he got his gold at the end, so he finally went home happy. The story behind Oliveira was somewhat unique, uh, but not uncommon with amputees. The problem with wearing a prosthesis, it's a bit like wearing a pair of shoes that are too small. Every day, your feet will rub and you'll get blisters. And also, because of the heat build-up, because of the time of the day, based on your fluid retention, that stump will change shape all of the time. So even though you might have a prosthesis that's custom made, you still might get blisters because it's constantly changing shape all the time. So it's basically like me getting you to wear a new pair of shoes every day of a different size and a different design and hoping they're going to be comfortable. They're not. And what happened to Oliveira was that after two weeks of competition, he was basically, his leg was a mess. It was bleeding, it was swollen, the skin had been removed, he was limping, you can't, you know, it was pretty painful. And he was at the end of his rope. And he was pretty iffy in the 100, and at the 400 metres, because of the length of the event, because of the cumulative damage had been built up over a point of a week, he was basically a, a broken mess. And he did his best, but he, there just wasn't anything left. He was tired, and it, yeah, it was just raw, basically. If you can imagine me taking the top layer of skin off your foot, then putting your shoe in and asking you to go and run 100 metres really, really quickly, or 400 metres really, really how painful that would be, that's what he'd done for nearly a week. So he was a tough old bastard. Yeah, he stood up to it pretty well. Anyway, so that was the 400 metres. The significant change between this and the previous games was was that at the, well, at the 2008 Olympic game, or Paralympic game, sorry, I should say, there was only two semi-finals and a final. In that final, there's only one bilateral amputee, and that was Pistorius. At these games, there were three semi-finals. There were four, or, well, half the field was basically bilateral amputees and half the finalists were bilateral amputees in most of the events as well. It shows you that the times are now changing. More amputees have been inspired by the stories, more of them are seeing what is actually possible. It's a bit like you saying bolt in 100 metres. Once someone realises that a barrier can be breached, a bit like Roger Ballaston with a four minute mile, suddenly, psychologically, everyone gets their heads around it and can do it. And the same thing's happened here. So at the next games, there'll be more athletes and it will develop from there. Uh, the other significant difference was basically that. What was I going to say? I can't remember. I'll come back to that. But anyway, yeah, so that was basically the difference in the, the 2008 and the 2012 games, and the sport was often developed, so the standards would continue to drive down. How long will it be before an amputee sprinter can compete equally with an able bodied athlete and win a goal? If you follow the projections, if you follow the way the times have developed over the last 30 years since 1976, in two Olympic Games' this time, there's going to be an athlete that will compete and have the possibility of winning a medal. That's the games after Rio. The other problem that the sport's also got is that Oliveira is from Brazil. And where are the next Olympic Games? In Rio, which means Oliveira is probably going to want to run. I would. Okay. Which means they're not going to have the stories to worry about now. They're now got Oliveira as well, who's younger and can only get faster. Because, as I said, he's a little bit fat. He can get a lot leaner. And I don't, I don't want to come back to him. He says I've been a bit disparaging. But elite athletes are not fat. They are lean. They have body, percent, body fat percentages of 5% or less. They're incredibly well developed. Oliveira is effectively a rookie. And he can already run within two or three seconds of, the, of a world final finalist that would get in the 400 metres. So the situation is going to get very, very frantic in the very near future. So that's basically the sport as it stands. So just to wrap up really for the future, how do we, what are the issues we've got coming up? The main issue is that prosthetics technology, as I've said, is already going to develop and extend. So we're going to have more complex prosthesis that will have computer control movements. Basically, the computer in the leg will move the knee, it will have its own knee, sorry, it will swing the leg back and swing it forward 
computer control in time, in sync with the biological limb. So they're going to be perfectly symmetrical, perfectly balanced. That limb can obviously be tuned up to give more power than what would be naturally be determined. So that is a problem that needs to be resolved. There are more amputee runners, the more guys have realised they can run the distance. So as a result, we can have more of these guys trying to, cross, trying to get across. Uh, so that's another issue that needs to be resolved. So what does that mean to the sport? Bottom line is I don't know. If you ask what my opinion is, I personally don't think they should run. No, I, was, I was doing it at the end because it means when you guys start throwing glasses at me, I'm not being very fair and giving up the run at the door. But the reason is, is that, I mean, I don't believe they should, he should be allowed to run. It's fundamentally a philosophical answer, not actually a physical one at all. If you, my belief is that running involves a certain action, a certain way of swinging the leg, of positioning that leg on the floor, and moving forwards. It is a style. It is not a, a, a title as such. Running isn't a title, it's a style. Pistorius does not run using the same motion as a biological equivalent. They don't. He runs in a very different way. Richard Whitehead, as I've already said, runs like he's an egg whisk. Because he doesn't need to run in the other way. It makes him very, very efficient. So they're, they're not using the same form of locomotion. If they're not using the same form of locomotion, it isn't running. Therefore, they should run in the competition that's provided for them, which is the Paralympics, which is well developed and has been more than enough to keep these guys competitive for years to come. If you let them into the Olympics, you're ultimately going to change the face of sport forever. It's already happening. And you need to be very, very mindful of that, because otherwise it's just going to become a technological arms race, which is kind of where I came at the very start of all this. And that is pretty much that.